will Central America become one country? Central America, the region of the continent most affected by economic problems, dictatorships, and even gangs. But did you know that more than 200 years ago, it existed as a single nation? Yes, instead of five countries, there was only one, and it was the third largest. But what is its history? Can it become a single Central American nation again and regain its status? Come with me to find out. But first, subscribe to the channel and turn on the notifications. It would be good to give a little historical context. And for this, we must mention the Captaincy General of Guatemala, which was an entity that was part of the Viceroyalty of New Spain and included the current Central American countries, except Panama, as well as the Mexican state Chiapas. The countries we recognize today were provinces within the Viceroyalty until independence. After independence, the provinces joined the ephemeral First Mexican Empire, which, with the exception of Chiapas, would eventually become states within the Central American Federal Republic. The nascent country would not be an exception in the region in terms of incessant internal conflicts, in this case, between conservatives represented by the church and the Asinenia clan, and liberals led by Francisco Marazan. After a civil war, Marazan was able to take power and transform Central America into a prosperous and progressive country. However, the church and the powerful Asinenia plan eventually convinced Central Americans that Morazan was an enemy of the people, and another civil war broke out. In the midst of this constant chaos and instability, Morazan finally went into exile in Peru, and the Central American states began to proclaim their independence one by one. The liberal leader returned to Costa Rica in 1842, where he became de facto head of state, but was eventually captured in a mutiny in Aloela and sentenced to death. Thus, a divided Central America ruled by conservatives would gradually move away from Morazan's humanist and liberal dream. Throughout the 19th century, however, there were some attempts at Central America reunification. In 1849, the national representation of Central America was created, in which El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua formed a confederation that established a single external representation, but it was dissolved three years later after El Salvador and Nicaragua rejected the statute. In 1885, Guatemalan President Barrios, with the support of Honduras, tried to force the other three countries to reunite, but without success. Ten years later, in the municipality of the same name in Honduras, the Pact of Ampala was signed between the governments of El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Honduras. The architect of this project being the president of the latter country, Policarpio Bonilla. In three years, this project changed its name to the United States of Central America, but it only lasted three months after the Salvadorian general, Tomas Regaldo, carried out a coup d'etat that separated his country from the Federation, which was followed by Nicaragua. In the 20th century, we can mention the creation of the Organization of Central American States, an organization that seeks to promote cooperation and integration among the five countries that formed the former Republic of Central America. In 2014, the Citizens' Movement for Central American Integration, Movimento Ciudadano, Para la Integración Centroamericana was founded, a social movement that aims to unite the five countries in question. To date, the MCIC has established state councils in all of the countries except Costa Rica, for obvious reasons, since it's the country in which there is the least interest in a possible reunification. Speaking of quality, if there is one politician of impressive popularity who has openly shown his sympathy for reunification ideas, it's the president of El Salvador, Nayib Bukele, who was gaining more and more power in his country. This begs the question, is reunification really possible? Let's imagine for a moment, what would happen in a hypothetical future if it were to happen? At the end of 2023, after President Bukele's popularity has reached its peak, with the drastic reduction of crime in El Salvador and with an absolute majority in the parliament, a constitutional reform is made that allows the president to be re-elected indefinitely. Thus, Bukele won the 2024 elections and obtained a new mandate with a large majority in parliament. In it, he intensified his discourse on Central Americanist ideas. Bukele and his party, Nuevas Ideas, have successfully sought to extend their influence to other countries, invoking historical revisionism and glorifying the image of Marzan, of whom he has a painting in his office. This success is reflected in the progressive growth of humanist ideas among Nicaraguans, Hondurans, and Guatemalans. This is reflected in the fact that various political parties in Guatemala and Honduras 
Morazan's home country, are beginning to include the Central Americanist element in their speeches. The more they talk about it, the more seats they get in parliament. The big problem in Nicaragua is an authoritarian regime led by Daniel Ortega, where ideas outside the government are not allowed. The solution is covert interventionism. If we covertly arm a volunteer organization in El Salvador called the Sons of Morazan, this would actually be a highly organized group of Guatemalan, Salvadoran, and Honduran infiltrators entering Nicaragua to scare the population into rising up against the Sandinista dictatorship. Thus begins a series of protests that turns into a civil war after some factors of the armed forces rebel against the Ortega government. Meanwhile, Honduras and Guatemala are organizing referendums to unite with El Salvador in 2029 and 2030, respectively. At the same time, Bukele continues to hold on to power, making El Salvador the safest country in Latin America, despite criticism from human rights offenders, which has only increased its popularity. By an overwhelming majority, Honduras and Guatemalans say yes to the Central American Union, which would take effect in 2032. Thus was born the Second Federal Republic of Central America, with its capital in Tegucigalpa, the birthplace of Morazan, and a strategic location in the center of the country, or at least in the center of the territory the government intended. Let us not forget that Nicaragua has been in a state of civil war since the new government took office in Tegucigalpa. President Bukele calls for the pacification of Nicaragua, which means sending troops to the country. At that time, Russia, the only power allied with the Ortega regime, was already in decline after its defeat in Ukraine. So the United States, despite criticizing the Bukele regime as dictatorial, politically supported the invasion of Nicaragua. In only six months, Ortega was overthrown and a government with Central Americanist ideas was installed. It was only a matter of time before Nicaragua, after a referendum, became the fourth member of the Federation. While all this was happening, in the previously unmentioned country, Costa Rica had approved the restoration of the armed forces in 2030. The Ticos were accustomed to living in a full democracy comparable to European standards, and with no internal violence and a high quality of life, Central Americanist ideas never took hold in the country. At the same time, Bukele was labeled a dictator, of course, because of the abysmal difference between Costa Rica's level of development and that of the other four countries. After Nicaragua joined Central America, Bukele continued to hold on to power. As a result, relations with the United States deteriorated again leading to Central America's expulsion from the OAS and the Inter-American Treaty of Reciprocal Assistance, a mutual defense pact between various countries in the region. For this reason, Central America made a rapprochement with the only power counterbalancing the United States, China, with which it signed a secret pact of defensive alliance. After becoming its main political and economic partner in the region, Bukele's new discourse for the annexation of Costa Rica is based on irredentism, referring to the Costa Rican minority in favor of unionist ideas as part of the Central American people. In addition, the country is considered a historical territory since Alajuela was the place where Morazan, whose last position was that of president of Costa Rica, died. Thus, after strengthening his forces, Bukele orders the invasion of Costa Rica in the year 2042, the bicentennial of Morazan's death. Costa Rica's newly formed and inexperienced armed forces had to hold out for about two weeks until the TR was officially activated. The United States then came to Costa Rica's defense after a missile landed in the Central America border community of San Juan del Norte. The Sino Central American Alliance was activated. It's important to note that this treaty was signed after the constant tensions between China and the United States due to the invasion of Taiwan in 2039, which ended up becoming a war of attrition. Thus, Central America became a new proxy zone, where the confrontations culminated in 2043 with the victory for the United States and Costa Rica. In the end, proximity played a key role. After the defeat, Bukele goes into exile in China, and the conditions for peace with the government in Tegucigalpa include the disintegration of the Second Federal Republic of Central America. Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua were left off worse than before the unification. So Morazan's dream became a new migratory crisis that the Ticos had to face. Let's get back to reality. As you know, geopolitics is unpredictable, so we cannot know for sure what the events of a possible Central American reunification would be, for which there are strong desires as well as rejections by other factions. What do you think would happen if the Federal Republic of Central America were to reemerge?
don't forget to leave a comment and subscribe to the channel.